I love light. Once you get beyond the sort of basic mechanics of drawing objects in space, light is going to be your storyteller. If you look at these two different photos, you can see that a simple change of lighting sets an entirely different mood, even though the scene is very similar. And as such, light is an integral aspect of your drawing, whether it's from something you're looking at or something you're imagining. And like in the previous chapters, though, there's a certain limitation to what copying will allow you to do, because you're never going to have exactly that right reference material when what you're painting is a dragon. Honestly, most illustrations involve a lot of imagined lighting. And as those first two photos prove, it really matters what these choices are. So in this video, there's not enough time to talk about the psychology of light. And that is pretty interesting, and I get into that a bit in the Design Basics video series if you want to know more. But instead, I'm going to focus on how you can learn the general properties of light in order to simplify and utilize them in your mind's eye, how to imagine light. So as you've probably seen by now, I like to simplify. I'll prefer to sacrifice a little bit of exactness if it allows me to rotate an object in my mind's eye, because then I have so much more versatility. And even though it might seem really different, light is actually no different than the subjects we've already looked at. So we're going to start by creating a few categories to help simplify the process. The first one is a point light. So in this case, envision a small incandescent bulb, like a floor lamp. If it didn't have a shade, it would project out in all directions equally. But then when you add any sort of shade or potentially a thick stand, some of that light is going to be obscured. And that's going to add a little extra shadows. But notice that the shadows of a small light like this are going to be relatively sharp. It's going to have very pronounced shadows. And as you begin to look through photos, you can identify what a point light looks like. Now, a specific variety of a point light is a spotlight, just like somebody on a stage. And this has similar properties, although it is focused into a narrow beam. So it's sort of like a very bright floor lamp with a really narrow shade. So the light only comes out in one direction. So let's look at the shadows. In this case, the shadows are usually pretty hard. It can be a bit softer, but it still has a very pronounced shadow edge. It casts a hard shadow because the light is coming from such a small emitter. So really, a spotlight is not all that much different from your desk lamp that has a very tight shade on it. The next type of artificial light is an area light. An example of this might be fluorescent lighting. So here, instead of a point light or a spotlight, the light is actually physically emitting from a larger object. And what that translates into is there's less directionality in the lighting and less directionality in the shadows. This gives you sort of softer shadows. Or if you have enough of these lights, you really don't have any shadows at all. So like I said, fluorescent lights are a place to find these. If you're ever in some fancy restaurant or lobby, you might see recessed lighting coming from a hidden source. And another example of this is actually if you have a window blind on a sunny day. So you're not seeing the sun directly. The sun is hitting this material and diffusing. So what you end up with is a big glowing rectangle. And this big glowing rectangle is a lot like a photographic softbox. So this is a large area that's all emitting light in a less directional way. And this is really nice because it doesn't cast those harsh shadows. So this is going to make people's faces look prettier. When you don't have the dramatic hard edge shadows, people tend to look more beautiful. And you might be surprised to hear that the biggest example of an area light is actually the sky. Now, I'm not talking about the sun. I'm talking about the rest of the sky dome, the atmosphere. On a cloudy day especially, when you can't see the sun directly, you'll notice that there aren't really any cast shadows anywhere around. It's all very evenly lit. Well, this is because the entire sky is emitting light equally, and it's sort of bouncing around everywhere. This is a lot like that idea of the sun coming in through your window blind. It's being diffused. 
Well, this type of lighting is also really flattering, and a lot of portraits are taken outdoors, either in the shade or on cloudy days, because it eliminates those harsh shadows. Do notice, though, that it can flatten the sense of space, and that's because normally cast shadows give a sense of dimensionality. So if you remove all the cast shadows, you end up with a scene that feels flatter. Okay, so if you can think of the sky as a huge diffused light source, this is a great lead-in to the biggest light source of all, which is the sun. Now, you might think I'd want to mention the sun first. After all, it is the primary light that the world has ever seen. But I'm going to mention it last because it combines aspects of each of the previous concepts into sort of a complicated package. So first you have direct light. You'll know you're getting direct sunlight if it's a clear day and you can see cast shadows. So the sun is technically a really large point light, but it's so far away that you can essentially think of the rays of sun as parallel. And this means that they actually cast these harsh shadows in a really predictable way. And so if you want to add sunlight to your image, it's relatively straightforward how to figure out where the shadows would go. Even on a sunny day, the atmosphere still serves as this large, soft area light. And that means that the sun is a bit like a big spotlight, but then what would normally be left in dark shadow is actually filled back in with this secondary indirect light. And this light is less dominant, and it's also cooler in color temperature. And what that does is it lowers the density of shadows. You can still see objects inside of shadows, unlike if you were on a darkly illuminated stage and only those objects in the beam of light were visible. Another place to see only the indirect light of the sun is if you're inside during the day and you have an open window, but the sun is not actually shining directly in. So you don't see that big rectangular beam of light but your room is still illuminated. You don't even need to have any overhead lights on because there's all this ambient light that's bouncing off the atmosphere, coming in through your window, and bouncing around very evenly. And you'll know that it's indirect light because there aren't very strong shadows. If you did have direct sunlight coming through your window, you would have a much starker definition between the illuminated area and the shadow area. But once you begin to understand these individual elements, you can envision how they might intersect. So it's common to have multiple lights in a scene. You would very rarely just have like a single spotlight. But if you did have a harsh point light, maybe as the dominant light on a character, you would want to soften those dark shadows in with sort of a fill light. And this might be either a dimmer point light or a soft area light. And this might be an opportunity to use a colored light. So this has both the drama of cast shadows, but then it softens it and gives it a bit of nuance with the fill light. The combinations are endless. But with these basic light templates in mind, I encourage you to begin to look at photos, look at illustrations, movie stills, paintings. Reverse engineer the lighting. Shadows are usually a great place to start. Are there shadows at all? If so, then there's some direct lighting. Are the shadows hard? Well, then that means the light source would be intense and small. Or it's the sun, in which case you're outside on a sunny day. What if the shadows are soft? Well, that means that the light is large and diffused. Or there are a number of lights all adding up and softening the shadows. Or you're getting the subtle ambient light reflecting in from the sky dome. And this is going to limit your shadows to the very deep recesses of a room. It's only in the corners and crevices. Ultimately, though, through understanding what you see, you can begin to invent scenes from what you know. Because it's easy to find lighting situations that are cool in photos, but they're never going to match the subject matter that you need. So the trick is taking your understanding of these general categories of light, adding in a dose of extra reference material to get the specifics, and then apply that to your imaginary scene. Take a line drawing that you've created, one that involves both perspective and form, and envision the lights. 